Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Boots here for the World Golf Hall of Fame. Welcome back to our Moments That Matter After Show series. And we are joined by 2012 Hall of Fame inductee, the great Sandy Lyle. Sandy, how are you? Well, I'm very well, thank you. I'm in, enjoying the summer here in Scotland at the moment. So I'm locked in. What's it like right now in Scotland? Is it, is, are you guys as locked down as us in the States? Yes, I was, um, I was locked down just about February, early February. I'm very lucky here because we have a lot of space and uh, just enjoyed watching the plants come and go and the daffodils and stuff like that. And the, now cutting the grass like three times a week out here. My own practice ground just um, on my other side here. So uh, and a lot of cutting and keeping herself busy. And we've got a daughter here at the moment with a grandchild. So we're, we're pretty busy. Beautiful. So the greens are fast right now on your practice green. You're mowing them every day. Uh, but I'm at just the practice ground. I'm not doing the greens. <laughs> <laughs> so this week we talked about the iconic, the five-pound note, when the Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank, celebrated Jack Nicholas, Do you remember when that came out? I do. You know, I was actually um, part of the, the launch. Um, we had a pro-am at Presswick, not Presswick, um, at Troon. And um, it was the big launch was right there. So I got to see when we got the five-pound note and everything else. And obviously Jack was there, of course. And it was a bigger, big occasion. I mean, you know, I think Faldo said a few things in that, you know, for a, an American to be on a Scottish you know, five pound note is, it, it must mean something. Absolutely. Now, what did Jack mean to you uh, growing up and, and, you know, growing into yourself? What did watching his game do for you? And how did that shape you as a golfer, if at all? Yeah, well, I think the earlier days, um, when I was only a junior, um, the, the big three, obviously, were Gary Player, Arnold Palmer, and then obviously the big Jack Nicholas. And Jack was always... Uh, my favorite in a way that um you know what he did um winning all these majors like it like it was a shopping list it was was <laughs> quite remarkable I mean, and then also back in 86 i had the chance of um playing with him the only time really i'd play with him in a tournament uh, was at the masters 86 which uh, he won so um you now people say to me oh were you you're nervous playing with jack he said i said no, not too bad. I said I was more nervous about not making a mess of his scorecard at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. So 86, his big comeback there at the Masters, and then you go to take it in 88. What did yeah. you learn? What did you learn in 86 or years prior that got you ready for taking it home? I really thought the, the way his uh, mannerisms and the last sort of six holes or so and his routines were never varied. I mean, you would not realize uh, what we were playing in down the stretch, you know, as far as the pressure. You know, there was never any heavy breathing or any sort of decision making and re rethinking about a club and uh, getting a bit frustrated. It was, it was almost like we were playing a Sunday afternoon practice round at Augusta. Other than noise was tremendous. And the more the noise was, the better his focus. He could tell by his eyes. Um, he focused really well. And I think that was what I took away from that was really is, is he was somebody at the age of 46 um, demonstrating to me this is what you have to do kind of scenario. And uh, it was a great spectacle to watch. You know, you know, I was still trying to do well myself. I, I think I shot 70, 71, which doesn't sound too bad. But uh, again, 65 is a big difference. Right. right. So what is it like going into 88 for you? Were you locked in in your practice round? How confident were you heading into that Masters 88? Uh, reasonably confident. Um, I had played quite a numerous amount of tournaments uh, beforehand in the West Coast and the Florida Swing. And then um, I managed to win the tournament um, at Greensboro the week before. So the game was in, you know, fairly, fairly high. So I always felt that some stage the Masters was one of the ones that I was possibly capable of doing because I, I enjoyed the course. That was the yeah. thing. If you enjoy the course and it suits your eye, there's no rough to worry about. There's no kind of U.S. Open 
10 yard wide fairways and right, right. rock hard greens, you can't stop the ball. And this was just fair golf. And if it's windy, and it was breezy, dry most afternoons when I was playing. So the course was not an easy task all the time. You're on a knife edge. But I, I enjoyed it. I mean, uh, it was, I wish the finish would have been a bit cleaner. You know, having to uh, have double bogeys at 12th and things like that. They're not making birdies on the par fives coming in. And uh, I made it very hard for myself. But, um, you know, in the end, it's just a... a it's just history, really, from the bunker. And I've been, you know, a lot of mileage from that over the years. And people remember the bunker shot. You know, that Absolutely. was 30 odd years ago, whatever it was now. It, uh, you know, it's very memorable. There was a touch of magic. That was definitely a moment that mattered right there. Shoot. What was the following year? What did you uh, serve up at the Masters dinner? I served up uh, beef as a main course. Okay. The Scottish beef, and then there was some haggis as a starter. And uh, I think a lot of them weren't too sure what the haggis was. But the, the old campaigners, like the Nicholas and the Palm and the Gary players, they're all familiar. Sure. You know, well, many times of having haggis. And uh, I, I didn't um, push them too much with it. It was only like a little uh, tablespoonful of a little <laughs> bit of the medicine. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, they all, I think most of them met it anyway, but it was only just a taste. <laughs> hey, so when you, when you started your career as a pro and you take home the Sir Henry Cotton Rookie of the Year, what kind yeah. of pressure did that put on you? Or was that just a feather in the cap? I think it was just a feather in the cap at the time. Yeah. And it was from Henry Cotton, that was that always meant something as a starting point. Yeah. And, um, you know, every new golfer turns pro and they're obviously under the microscope. Um, for that year of play, and then you, uh, you they announce who's going to be the Henry Cotton Player of the Year kind of thing. Right. And, um, you know, Henry was always a good supporter of the European Tour, and I used to see him at least three or four times a year, if it was at the major tournaments or something down in London. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I would have loved talking to him, just pinching his ideas and the what we used to do, we used to change out. We weren't allowed to go in the clubhouse to all this kind of scenario. Oh, you know, wow. Changing the cars and things. <laughs> Wait, you're one of the coolest, calmest golfers we've ever seen out there on the greens. Where did that come from? Was was that always part of your personality, or did you learn that from someone? I ought to speak to my wife about that. <laughs> oh, she keeps you calm. <laughs> no, she said you're not bloody calm. <laughs> You get in a car and you turn a different person all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> turn at the light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I've always, I mean, there is fire burning now. I think in, in any, any champion golfer who plays at a high level, there has to be some fire in, there, in the sure. belly to win, but do it in the right way. I think my man, my father was very keen on, um, you know, likes of what, Arnold Palmer, if he um, mislaid or broke a golf club under temper, it was some penalties involved and da 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 da. So I was very similar to what Arnold Palmer had, you know, and I do remember breaking a putter on the golf course, not in a tournament. This was a, a young junior playing with some of my pals. I think Woozy might have even been involved at that time and throwing a putter off the green in disgust and then. It just happened to hit one of these grand under repair posts, which is like a two by two. Oh, no. Dead center of the shaft and just went around like a horseshoe. <laughs> and, broke. and I was like, I was in horror. <laughs> it was, I was, what's my dad going to think about this when I get back in? And what has been two pieces? And <laughs> so that was the and I think that was the control, your discipline, it uh, was drummed into me. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's always little sayings that you know, tempo before temper, this kind of thing. Mm. Um, do the waltz, not the quick step on the on the golf course. These these little things, very simple little things, but mean an awful lot. Absolutely, and it was really cool uh, in a PGA piece that you had done when you talk about you and your father's relationship and growing at, growing up on the course that your father worked on. What yeah. was one of the coolest things you picked up just trailing your father there at the golf course and seeing, seeing how he handled himself and, you know, learning the, learning the greens young? Yeah, my old man um, was a steady golfer. You know, he, 
I mean, golf and professionals and club professionals you know, back in the 50s were totally different to, uh, to what they are now. But my, my dad was basically wearing two hats. He was running the pro shop and the, as, a, as a normal pro does, but he also he was in charge of the golf course. So he had to have a couple of assistants help him out. And, and so he was managing that. So I saw the, the hard work involved and... And also, he was a keen golfer. I mean, he was, in the evening time, we would go out and play a few holes. And the challenge was, obviously, me being a little one, and was hit the ball a bit further and a bit further and try and get past the old man, you know. So eventually, after, I don't know what age I was when I was hitting the ball past him, but um, I zoomed past him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the kind of what the, the competitiveness, you know, gets you going. Oh. And, um, you know, learning, and he was a good chipper and putter. Um, from his sort of boredom times, when before he moved down, down south in England, he was in, obviously, at our, our home golf course in Glasgow, oh, yeah. uh, called Clover. And some of the uh, down times, he would be chipping into a, uh, to the tee box area, which was a, like a litter bin, but it was about four feet off the ground. And you used to lie your golf bag against it. And then this little litter box was about a foot by foot. And he used to chip, you know, balls from a certain distance and into the letter box or the litter box. So that was his way. So he's chipping become very, very good. And I think the best he did was like nine out of 12, which was pretty amazing. Wow. You imagine this box is about four foot high, five foot high. <laughs> and the angle of attack, there's not much room for error. So uh, I think I learned from that, from, from his chipping abilities. Um, he was good at chipping, and then I watched and copy, and then I did there, and the whole thing. But he was never, never a forced guy, my dad. He was never banging out, do this, do that, and getting temperamental. He was very, he did it in a different way. You know, he might look out the window of the kitchen over the walls of practice range, and he might just kind of say, well, son's that. Nobody on the practice ground at the moment, just hinting. Yeah. Right, right. What are you doing here? You're doing whatever. <laughs> get out there. <laughs> Let's get out there. That's awesome. Now, what part of your game? What part of your game was the strongest right off the bat? And then, what part of your game did you put in the most practice on to cultivate? Um, well, my my practice routine would be around the big oak tree. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was the most I would practice because just trying to hit balls straight is you know hard enough. Right. And going through the whole bag and then my little tube of golf balls and da 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 da. But my, my sort of downtime on the range would be playing uh, with this beech tree on this practice ground, huge big beech tree with gaps in it. So I would play through the gaps oh. in the tree from certain distances. And then I would go the other side of the range and then use the tree again and go from left to right, and then so on and so on. Go underneath the branches, go over the tree with a fade, with a ball. And I think that was probably what I did the most, was um, shot making, really. And I think it's a bit like what Bubba Watson does, as I've heard it, he on the range, he never tries to hit a straight shot. Right. So he tries to shape shots. And shaping shots, really, you know, to me, come very naturally um, when I'm on the golf course, and I love the challenge and I'm not frightened to have a go. And that's really just from all the practice routines of, uh, you know, on the, on the range. Well, folks, we'll say a quick prayer, all the listeners uh, watching, for all the squirrels in their trees that they're going to be shooting at today with those balls. <laughs> Blame it on Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Sandy, thank you so much for catching up with us here. And, folks, if you have not checked out this week's Moments That Matter special yet, be sure to log on to the World Golf Bowl of Fame and all of our social media platforms. Catch it there. And Sandy, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Cheers.